so thanks for taking the time out to join us tonight. Um, I believe that everyone can hear okay, but if um, you're having any problems or it's not very good quality, just drop us a note in the question or chat box. So I'm Miriam Druitt, I'm the Marketing Communications Manager with AHDB Cork, and I'm delighted to bring you tonight's webinar. We'll be looking at the Canadian pig industry and covering some of the key highlights from a recent trip by Richard Bowes and Angela Cliff, two of our Knowledge Exchange Managers. It's great, we've got a nice mixture of people logged on tonight. We've got some producers, students, vets and allied industry. So hopefully there'll be something for all of you to take mm -hmm. away tonight. The plan is for Richard and Angela to run through their presentation, which should take around 30 minutes or so. And there'll be time for questions at the end. At present, all of you, will be, all of you are muted, so we can't hear any background noise and you won't be able to speak during the course of the webinar. Um, if you'd like to ask a question um, or if you've got any issues, just drop us a note in the question or chat box and we'll get back to you and we'll ask any questions at the end of the webinar. We'll endeavour to keep the webinar running as smoothly as possible, but just in case there are any issues, do bear with us and we'll try and get us back on track as soon as we can. So without further delay, I'm delighted to introduce you to our speakers, Richard and Angela. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> this evening, uh, the content's uh, going to be uh, uh, set in four sections. Uh, I'm going to give an overview of the Canadian pig industry, which uh, Angela and I will uh, will share. Uh, I'll cover the uh, Prairie Swine Centre. Uh, Angela's going to talk about the uh, DNL Farms Limited uh, production on uh, how to move pigs and handle pigs. And then Angela and I will uh, cover uh, different aspects of the uh, London Swine Conference. As there was different uh, workshops going on at the same time, we went to uh, uh, different uh, workshops. So we'll, we'll cover as much of that as we can as well. So... Uh, as an overview, there's um, currently 1.2 million sales uh, in Canada. Uh, in general terms, most people when we were out there were saying to us that uh, as far as regulations goes, uh, they're approximately 10 years behind us and we'll, we'll cover some of them aspects as we go along. Uh, the emphasis at the moment is that they're uh, uh, trying to get the uh, industry to remove all the sales stalls and uh, the intention is that um, all sales have to be group housed by uh, 2024, so they've, they've got quite a bit of time yet. So uh, a lot of the work, as you'll see again going forward, is, is, is based around uh, uh, getting uh, moving animals from stalls to some form of loose housing. Uh, it's predominantly slatted accommodation over there. Uh, there is a little bit of straw use, but uh, very little. Uh, and with that, there is some interest in, in niche markets. Uh, where the uh, uh, pigs will be kept on straw and uh, any organic production and uh, uh, can be employed then and uh, the, the obvious uh, price benefits are that uh, comes at a cost obviously as well. Uh, in, in general terms, the cost of production uh, was quoted at uh, 160 Canadian dollars per uh, pig, that's per finished pig. Uh, so the graph in front of you there um, shows you uh, uh, the production or annual production in, in, in amounts of millions of heads of pigs from 2011 to 2018. Uh, and as you can see, there's uh, not a lot of difference across across that period. Um, and it's equivalent to approximately 24.6 pigs sold per sow per year. And uh, similar to what we've experienced here in the rest of Europe, uh, as you can see from 2011 to 2017, their average born alive has gone up from something like probably 11.6 uh, to currently uh, around 13 uh, born alive. So uh, they've had uh, quite a bit of genetic improvement there across uh, all the genetics that they use in Canada. Uh, this little uh, clip I, I managed to get when I was at the uh, Prairie Swine Centre, and, and as you can see, it's, it's saying that 70% uh, of cent total export sales are going uh, to the US and Japan from Canada. So obviously that's a very important market, but like, like we do here in Europe and in particular UK, uh, a lot of pigs are going to China and elsewhere as well. Uh, again, a little bit like here, labour is an issue in regards of recruitment and retention. Um, the Canadian pork industry is a popular work destination for people from the Philippines, 
a little bit like we have uh, people from uh, Eastern Europe work, working here. And their mission statement for the industry is, we as an industry agree we have an understanding for animal care. So there's certainly an emphasis on, on, on making sure that the animals are, are well looked after. I'm just going to hand over to uh, Angela for the next slide. Yes, good evening, everybody. Um, so I, um, I'm going to try and describe the uh, kind of the industry organisation, which uh, was a, a bit complicated for us. So I shall, uh, I'll hopefully I've got it um, kind of ironed out. So um, at the, if you like, at the top of the pyramid, there's the, uh, the Canadian Pork Council, CPC. Uh, and this is the national voice. Uh, of producers and it comprised uh, is made up from the nine federal groups because you know Canada is very large um, and each area has its own kind of um, uh, autonomy but uh, the federal groups actually uh, produce the funds to support the, uh, the, the uh, Canadian Port Council which is a non-profit organization and the mission for the uh, CPC it says there, advance, promote and protect the excellence of Canadian pork production through effective advocacy uh, programmes and communication. And uh, if you look at the, uh, the little sort of motifs at the bottom, um, these are their current programmes which are being um, executed by the Canadian Pork Excellence, which is the key national platform that covers uh, these three major components which consist of um, pig trace which is um, safe traceability um, food safety food safety which is pig safe and finally the animal care which is pig care and so um, very much uh, in, in line with uh, the, the sort of assurance uh, areas that we are also covering so good, good synergy there and so, um, with a view to uh, to their kind of assurance schemes, the uh, the Canadian Pork Excellence also operate a, a red tractor-like scheme um, called Animal Care Assurance, or ACA. <clears throat> Excuse me. But they're now introducing um, the new Pig Care, which we saw in the previous slide, uh, which is again is a non-farm uh, ACA, and uh, this will be uh, rolled out shortly as they have um, produced the new code of practice for their care and handling of pigs um, which was done from uh, within the industry and um, the government prefers the industry to legislate itself so the industry had um, you know good input into the sort of areas that they were wanting to uh, to concentrate on so um, the code of practice was produced by the national farm animal care council which was uh, um, I'm not sure how large the body was, but it, it included a diverse um, number of members from various um, areas of the industry, um, including producers, uh, vets, animal wear organisations, scientists, and I thought particularly intriguing were members of the public. So there was like total engagement uh, from the whole spectra of the, the pig organisation. And uh, the code covers, um, similar to ours, requirements and recommendations. And they are, again, introduced new uh, specifications for sow housing, which is the loose housing, uh, pain management at castration and docking, because, um, of course, they are uh, still castrating in Canada uh, and also docking like ourselves. So pain management with docking space allowances and environment enrichment so again uh, very similar to the areas that we are are focusing on ourselves so um, you can see that they are sort of aiming for um, comparability um, with our standards but um, the actual code itself um, is not as um, I think prescriptive is our welfare codes. Our welfare codes are definite sort of like regulations and there's more aspirations at the moment, but um, they are aiming towards um, all encompassing sort of animal welfare. Now back to Richard. Okay, so uh, uh, we're going to move on to the uh, uh, Pro Swine Centre now. So, 
also I thought it would be uh, interesting for us to, if I can get my uh, laptop to just work. This is obviously where the uh, Prairie Swine Centre is situated and it's uh, a three hour flight from Toronto. Uh, we actually flew into Toronto then flew from Toronto to uh, Saskatoon and while we were there um, we experienced minus 11 and um, the, the week previous and the week uh, later uh, it was actually minus 20. This is during the day by the way. Uh, it was actually minus 20 and uh, as you can see there we've put, they've actually experienced 90, minus 36 uh, which is um, quite horrendous. So they, they, they get some uh, really cold winters. I would add that they also get some quite warm uh, summers as well. Uh, I believe they can uh, certainly get into the mid 30s uh, uh, in the summer. So um, great variation in temperature to, to manage pigs. And this is uh, an actual uh, aerial photograph of the uh, Prairie Swine Centre. And um, as you can see, effectively, uh, it's made up of, of uh, one building, or, or at least the whole lot is connected together, uh, with the exception of the offices here. Um, and uh, I'll take note of the amount of bins that they have lined up here. These are uh, bulk feed bins. And also on the on the back side of the building there, these are all individual uh, feed uh, bins that so that uh, obviously they can feed uh, innumerable amounts of food to the pigs um, for uh, trials and uh, tests that they that they wish to do. Um, and then uh, this side is, is where they actually finish uh, just the normal pigs as against any trial pigs. Uh, hence, you've only got the three bins there. So that's sort of traditional finishing accommodation for the pigs that are not uh, used within trials. Uh, but as you can see, a very tidy site, uh, typical American stroke Canadian, uh, where it's you know very clean all around the outside, plenty of area um, away from uh, uh, other uh, fields and uh, effectively in the middle of nowhere. Uh, again, took this picture while I was, uh, uh, was waiting in the foyer at the Pro Swine Centre, uh, and they have a vision uh, which can be uh, an internationally recognised source of original practical knowledge providing value to our stakeholders throughout the port value chain. Um, in addition, they've actually got approximately uh, 325 uh, sales uh, on a firing weekly basis. Uh, they have PIC genetics. It's all fully slatted. Uh, they breed their own replacement gilts. Uh, on, on their unit, they're actually taking the pigs out of the uh, stalls. As you'll see later on, they've, they've converted the stall houses for other use. Um, so the sows are loosed housed during gestation, uh, post-pregnancy um, scanning. Um, but they do keep them in stalls uh, and they can keep them up to 35 days, but they keep them, generally speaking, for, for actually 28 days and then scan them and move them out. And one of the interesting things that we found out was that they, they actually... Uh, they, unit and not using any fish meal or milk products in any of their rations. It's just part of the uh, agreement they have with their um, stakeholders uh, that they have none of these products in for the trial work that they're doing. Uh, I'm on the right in this picture uh, and then the, the lady on the left is the uh, acting manager, uh, the day-to-day -day manager T Tatiana. And then in the middle there uh, is Lee Whittington, who's the CEO for the Prairie Swine Centre. So I just wanted to put up a little bit of herd performance here for you uh, across the last 10 months. Um, but to, to emphasise and make it a little bit easier, what we're trying to highlight here is the, uh, the actual born alive, uh, which is uh, currently 14.1 with a total born of 16.1. Uh, as you can see, I'll try and just point, there we go, 16.1 there, 14.1 there for, for the born alive. 89.6% um, uh, um, firing rate and a firing index of 2.49. And then uh, coming across to the uh, pre-weaning mortality, currently 12 point, well, the average 12.9%. Uh, average piglets weaned per litter is 12.7. And then moving down, uh, average piglet age is 24.8, lactation length is 24.8, and the piglets wean per sow per year is 29.3, um, which is uh, sort of top 10% uh, in Canada. 
and uh, Angela and I were very impressed um, with the fact that uh, they do, they're doing so many trials there. Obviously, that in, can interfere greatly in the actual uh, sort of husbandry and management uh, that the manager and their staff uh, have to take on. And so uh, we were really impressed with the, their results, uh, considering all what has to go in place. And um, here we have a herd parity profile. Uh, and I think, again, it's really just to sort of highlight uh, these uh, uh, drops in production uh, really highlight the effects uh, across certain parities uh, when they uh, have parities removed um, and uh, they actually, um, it means that it's not a, a structured normal unit. There's things going on that interfere with the, the profile of the, of, of the farm depending on what trials that's going on. Okay, so uh, I thought I'd just include a few pictures uh, to uh, give you a flavour for what we, we saw. Uh, this is showing the um, service area and uh, we've got a central aisle here. Uh, these are the um, stalls that the, the animals are kept in and uh, you can see there's actually some marks down the centre passage there on the floor. Uh, and that's highlighting obviously a feed trolley to give the pigs extra food because they're, they're fed actually by the, the tubes as individuals but then um, someone will go down with a feed trolley and if each indivi individual sound needs a little bit more then they'll they'll get uh, whatever they need so treat them as individuals in that respect and also um, they um, they use the uh, passageway um, to, to run the bore down but they run the bore down in in the actual uh, bore crate that's uh, automatic and so that runs down the the center of that previous passageway uh, with the bore inside moving from um, sort of uh, two or three about a couple of sounds each time so they can then serve those sounds just keep the bore moving down not too different in principle to to having a gated system and having the bore in a in a select area and then just moving him down so that you you get the uh, nose-to-nose -nose contact at service. So again, yeah, just a, an overview here of the um, of the service area from the from another side. Uh, as we've put here, maximum period confined is it, it allowable is 35 days, uh, and that allows for the winter service period as well as um, the 28 days from post service. Um, the coloured tubes that you can see on the back here, the yellow ones on the, on the left hand side and the sort of ready darker colours on the right hand side, uh, that alerts uh, the staff. Um, the red was for serving uh, and the yellow one was for pregnancy checking. So we're actually looking at two different lines of pigs here, but it's just to highlight that they've got these uh, 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 very simple ways of uh, detecting what uh, animals were where and what they what they needed doing so it's just a, a management aid really for the guys working on the ground so as i said earlier they um their sounds are loose house post uh, for gestation uh, period um and this was a um, conversion project run by and organized by dr jennifer brown and uh, as you can see <laughs> interestingly um the free access stalls and most of the sows are, are, are sat in the stalls, uh, certainly were when we were taking the picture and uh, just that one pig was out, outside and um, the, the uh, Dr. Jennifer Brown was saying that only 10% of the sows voluntarily, voluntarily leave their crates um, and so they've tried to make the uh, what they call the loafing area uh, more attractive um, and so um, they've introduced, if I put the other picture up for you to see, they've introduced uh, what they call comfort boards along the central joining slats. So um, this area here, just so that it's a little bit more comfortable uh, with the idea of uh, trying to encourage them to, to uh, not use the stalls quite so much. Uh, but as we know in England, for people who have these systems, very often the pigs do, uh, they do actually like to uh, stay in the stalls. Uh, more than lie outside, but uh, uh, they're certainly going, finding, trying to find other ways of, of making the sounds uh, happier and friendlier and, and mixing together in a better way. Uh, in addition to that, they have uh, what they call an activity area at this end uh, of the building. Um, and in, as you see in this picture, 
uh, we, uh, yeah, yeah, they've actually got um, a few sounds out here and they've also got some material here, which is, I believe is wood on a chain. Uh, so the sound's got something to play with as well. So it's all, all part of uh, the idea of uh, good welfare uh, for the pigs. So here we have uh, the guild housing. Um, and one of the interesting things uh, we <laughs> we uh, saw was the ventilation system here. Uh, this sort of tunnel effect with the uh, outlets here with uh, areas coming across the pigs. Uh, this is actually a fixed um, a tube uh, rather than a collapsible one, which um, you sometimes see in the UK. Uh, certainly back in the uh, 80s and 90s, it used to be quite popular. Um, generally speaking, these animal, these gilts in here, which the the own bred animals, um, would be um, sort of brought in this this area from about 60 kilos, uh, and they they start at the far end and, and and work so that they enter the building at this end and gradually work their way up uh, as they get older. And then they have a gilt puberty and heat detection area. Um, and um, obviously for ready for uh, making sure they've had at least one or two services, uh, sorry, one or two heats before they are served. And also uh, they were um, feeding the pigs on, on the floor here, which um, uh, wasn't possibly the most efficient way of, of uh, stopping feed being wasted, but uh, that's the system they have set up in this building. Um, and then another picture um, showing the same thing, really, but just a, a closer view here of the and animals where they get fed at this point here. And then obviously, as you can see, the boars housed at this side um, as the uh, um, ready for heat detection and the pigs are marked according to to when they come on heat. And then of course they moved away again then. Um, in the Farin uh, house, the uh, traditional crates, I guess, really, uh, you probably see these uh, across Europe and, and certainly in the UK a lot. What was interesting, as you can see at the bottom of the picture here, uh, they've got towels um, and they were actually uh, hand drying uh, the newborn piglets. Um, and uh, they've got uh, the creep area, which is a covered area. And um, I think they was using a combination of, of lighting to attract and heat pads in, in the Farron house as well, which again is not dissimilar. And obviously you've got the heat, sorry, you've got the, the lights on the side here as well as at the front. So if, when, once the sound starts firing, then um, uh, the piglets have got a bit of added heat there. And they were using uh, cornstarch to uh, help dry uh, the uh, uh, pens. Um, I know in, in England we use a lot of dry disinfectants, so it's uh, the principle is the same uh, to help dry the pens and uh, keep them from uh, getting too wet to reduce uh, disease uh, challenge and, and spread of scour, etc. So obviously being a um, a farm that's doing a lot of trials. Uh, it involves uh, a number of different sorts of trials. And uh, here we're taking a picture of a, a room that they're actually doing individual piglet trials, hence uh, the individual containers with their own drinkers and, and feed dispensers. And then the feed, as you can see on the floor in the, in the tubs, they're all outside each one, all being measured and obviously everything recorded, what the pigs eat to, to see what growth they have. And, 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 and all those uh, feed bins that you saw, obviously that relates to them as well, the amount of different feeds that they can try different pigs on to see what the reaction is. Uh, as well as that, they were doing uh, whole litter trials as well. And um, as you can see here, that uh, actually put quite a large amount of food in the, this hopper, which we, we were sort of quite surprised with. And that's when I asked uh, the, um, uh, I asked Lee, what was actually in the uh, the rations, and that's when he said that there was no milk or fish. So um, I'd have been a bit concerned with the amount of food that's in that uh, hopper with the uh, younger pigs with the heat of it going off if it being milk or something else in the ration. Um, I mentioned earlier about uh, the fact that they had stalls on, on this unit, um, but in actual fact, uh, this obviously shows um, 
where they've converted uh, into a finishing accommodation. Uh, but again, these were finishes on on trials. Uh, just a, uh, in this picture, we we'll probably see two, maybe three pigs. So small amount of pigs uh, in, in each pen. Um, but you've effectively got the solid area pathways that used to be for the stalls, and then the stalls are across here. So they've made use of the of the building quite well uh, for this use. Uh, and again, um, another conversion, an old stall house, and they've got areas at the solid at the back, which was obviously again the pathways, uh, and the, some of the pigs were using those a little bit, and then these were the slats where the stalls would have been at one time, and again, you're solid. Uh, but these were uh, the non-trial finishes, so these were just basic pigs that were were actually finishing. The, uh, the yellow um, uh, little bit of kit here is actually a, a fly trap, uh, which we thought was quite uh, interesting. Um, to be fair, we didn't see too many flies. Uh, I suppose you could say, well, if it's minus 11 or minus 20, then you wouldn't see many flies. But obviously, in the buildings, it was a bit warmer. And as we know, in the UK, even on a cold winter, we still get flies in buildings. So um, I would assume that uh, they probably get a few more flies in the summer, and hence that's why the fly traps are there, uh, ready for when the weather improves, which I think it has now, by the way. What was interesting, though, was, um, and we just took a picture of this, uh, was the, the fact that they seemed to run their actual uh, temperatures um, a lot lower uh, than what we probably would here, really. 15.3 um, for finishing pigs um, would uh, probably be at the well lower end of what most people would uh, be inclined to do in, in England. I, I would guess it's been nearer 18 would be a low. Um, but they were saying uh, that it seems to work quite well for their pigs and uh, um, it reduces heating costs uh, with not having to uh, uh, put more heat into the buildings. So uh, this part is um, where there was actually uh, measuring uh, uh, gas uh, in the air. Uh, these are fully enclosed units. Um, I think just at the time when we took the picture, there wasn't actually any pigs in, in the pen. They'd just come out. Um, but basically, uh, it was uh, run by uh, uh, Dr. Bernardo Predicala, and he manages the engineering research. Uh, another picture of me uh, with some pipes. And um, basically, they were looking more at the effects of gas for... Uh, on humans rather than on the pigs. Their emphasis is more to do with uh, uh, the effect on stockmen uh, rather than the, uh, the actual pigs. So, some of the research activities that was going on, they're obviously looking at gestation loose housing, which obviously with the, the, amount, uh, with the fact that they've got to get the pigs out by 2024, uh, that's their main focus. Feed trials, as we've just mentioned, uh, and understanding the interaction between diet composition, animal health and nutrient requirements, uh, environmental, environmental monitoring of staff only. Uh, they were saying that they're monitoring what goes on in the, U in the UK and U in the rest of Europe, and, and the expectation is that it'll all move towards the environment and there'll be more pressure on the environment. At the moment, uh, they're more interested in, in protecting staff rather than the outside environment. I'm sure it'll come down the line on that one. Um, they're looking into functional amino acids to support immune response and controlling pain uh, when tail docking using topical analgesic agents. Uh, as we said earlier, they're already, uh, they haven't stopped castrating. They are castrating their pigs. Whether that'll come in the future, we, we don't know. So, um, one of the uh, sort of focuses, I guess, uh, which I think is probably across the world really, is, is biosecurity. And um, they, they work on uh, trying to um, transfer um, uh, and disseminate um, what's going on at the Prairie Swine Center and, and sort of uh, send out messages. And they often need to repeat those. And so they use, uh, they use this, we took this picture of a, of a retro calendar. And um, uh, this is all funded through the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and uh, uh, it's all meant to obviously uh, keep uh, the industry uh, on a high alert to be as biosecure as they possibly can. And the um, 
I think there's two pictures there. Yeah, this is uh, quite a, a funny one with the sort of message that they're putting up. Um, and really trying to get people to, uh, you know, do the right thing through through a little bit of humour. But in, in the end, uh, you know, it's obviously a very, a very serious subject. And as you see on the picture on the right, uh, it was first published in, in 1996. So things, certain things never change. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Angela again. Now she's going to cover uh, the, the pig handling uh, from uh, DNL Farms. Yes, me again. Yes, so we were uh, lucky enough to uh, meet up with uh, Don and Nancy Lidster while we were in um, Saskatoon. And um, they have been um, involved in the training of uh, the, um, the handlers, the transport handlers with loading and unloading pigs, as well as um, moving pigs and handling pigs on farm. And um, they have uh, quite nice websites and have been involved with um, kind of industry uh, publications. And uh, the reason uh, that um, I, I was quite interested in, in meeting up and and, uh, and hearing about their work is that they have a, just a slightly different angle on um, on understanding uh, pig behaviour. So um, they call it um, low stress pig handling. And um, the ultimate aim is to is to make the job of moving pigs easier, safer, and more enjoyable. And um, although it might feel that uh, it's a slower process, ultimately the time it takes is uh, is shorter. So um, we are um, we are very aware of the uh, the little picture at the bottom, which shows um, which shows a pig and uh, inside a circle and uh, we have um, two areas we have the flight zone which is fz and we have the uh, the point of balance which is uh, um, usually at the shoulder of the pig and uh, and at the back we've got the blind spot and and from this sort of knowledge we um, we try and uh, and move our pigs successfully um, but um, there are problems from just focusing on this area alone and uh, you can see that uh, from the point of balance that, um, you know, they, that Nancy and Don, they think that uh, you're, you're kind of looking at a pig as though you were trying to, to, to move furniture. It's like the physics of the thing, you know, it's like a fulcrum. If you go one way on the point of balance and the pig will go um, the opposite. And it's not taking into account the actual uh, mental state or reading the, um, the animal's response to the environment and also to you. And um, it also assumes that if a pig stops uh, or turn back, it's because of something that has happened in front of their um, point of balance. And uh, one of the uh, one of the questions or one of the points that we learned from our, our meeting with them was, uh, um, you know, if if a, if pigs stop, it's usually because of something you've done, which uh, made you kind of rethink again, you know, what we're doing. And then in point, from the point of view of the flight zone and um, it, it, the sort of the handler should stay on the boundary of the animal's flight zone. But um, we're not too sure, you know, when do you identify that you're on the edge of the flight zone? And also, you know, if you move inside the flight zone, what, what happens then? And, and if that does happen, what can it, you know, can you move that to your advantage? And um, how where you're standing will impact on how a pig will be responding to you. So it just introduced some um, a different way of just sort of looking at that situations and um, also how animals behave because obviously that that particular diagram is talking about a single pig and very often pigs are moved in groups. So how does a, a group of pigs behave and you know what happens if you have followers and then you have like bunching and crowding and it, it just was very very interesting so um some of the uh, the, the false beliefs which is uh, one just i want to just share these with you because i do think they are you know quite interesting in themselves um you know one of the false beliefs is that pigs will do whatever they have to to keep us out of their flight zone that is a false belief more pressure produces a, a, a more or faster movement. So the more we pressurize pigs, the more we expect them to go forward. Pigs will always move away from the, uh, the pressure or the point of balance. 
Pigs that don't move away are too tame and require even more pressure. Like those two people pushing a cell down in the bottom right. We have to keep applying pressure to keep pigs moving. The flight zone or point of balance model explains the full range of pig behavior and does so accurately. And flight implies that fear aids pig movement. So it kind of, uh, as I say, introduces a, a whole new um, a whole new idea of looking at, uh, at looking at pigs, really understanding a pig's behavior. And it kind of teaches you to notice what your pigs are doing and then you're responding to the pigs rather than trying to get the pigs perhaps to respond to you. It really was a very interesting afternoon and uh, we very much hope that uh, we'll be able to entice um, Nancy and Don over to the UK at some time. So um, again, we'll keep you informed of whether we'll be able to uh, connect up with them sometime in the future. Um, so now I'm going to hand back to, um, to Richard. Okay, so uh, finally we're going to uh, cover the, uh, the London Swine Conference uh, and again uh, Angela and I will, will share our um, different workshops we went to. Um, so the snippets from some of the presentations, um, impact of, of piglet birth weights and colostrum intake, uh, you can see the people that uh, was actually presenting these, uh, pain relief at farrowing, uh, swine health back to basics, uh, precision pigs using big data, and then troubleshooting re reproductive uh, uh, issues. Uh, so the first slide really is just emphasizing um, the difference of uh, survivability uh, for piglets that are born really small uh, as against pigs that are, are, are actually above a certain weight. And um, as we know, if we can get a, a better pig born, then it's got a better chance of surviving and, and being a, a worthwhile pig. And same with the vulnerability. Um, uh, newborn pigs are obviously uh, uh, are vulnerable per se, but uh, the lower energy reserves they have, uh, the less uh, chance they have of survival. Um, and it, part of this, I mean, these are only a few clips really, but uh, really there was pushing home the the importance of colostrum and uh, making the, the points uh, that you know, colostrum provides energy uh, as well as uh, thermoregulation. It provides passive immunity in the immunoglobulins, uh, immunoglobulins, and it provides growth factors for development and maturation. But remember that the gut closes to uh, colostrum uh, between 24 and 36 hours. So it's important that uh, the piglets get the right amount in, in as soon as possible. And with that in mind, the sooner possible bit is that uh, that showed this graph um, of the uh, immunoglobulins again in the colostrum and the LG concentrations. And by 12 hours, uh, they've actually dropped by 50%. Um, so you can see how important when we, we talk about uh, getting uh, the piglets onto a teat in the first six hours, uh, uh, because uh, to get the, get the amount the piglet needs, it's got to be uh, as early as possible after farrowing. And I picked this one out because um, they, were, they were more or less saying that um, an average piglet, say 1.4 kilos, which would be very similar to probably to the UK, um, needs 250 grams of colostrum um, on average. Uh, and this will reduce your, your, your um, pre-weaning mortality. It gives them the immune protection and it'll improve the weight gain, but obviously right through its life as well. And one of the interesting things they were saying was that, in their opinion, a third of litters do not get enough colostrum uh, to fulfill their needs. One of the other things I found really interesting was uh, the use of uh, a product called Meloxicam um, as a pain management for, for farrowing sales. And um, as you can see by uh, uh, the graph I'm trying to bring, out, bring that up. If you can see, they've got a control group here, uh, similar, sim similar amount of pigs across same parities, um, but um, the con control group compared to the Metacam treated group, uh, there was significant uh, reduction in uh, they're put in overlies or crushed 
per sow. So uh, I guess the inference there really is that the, the piglets, uh, the sows, sorry, were, were uh, more settled uh, during the farrowing and post farrowing than the, uh, in the group that was given the metacam compared to the control group and consequently weren't getting up and down and, and running the chance of, of overlying the piglets. Um, <clears throat> they did mention, or I did state that uh, this was only um, a study on the effect of, of, of all meloxicum and that uh, they would like to do more work and do an official uh, um, bona fide trial. Um, but just in this one uh, snapshot, um, they, what I thought was really interesting was that they were saying that um, the treated sows, uh, piglets, gain 19 grams a day more until weaning. But what I think is really interesting is that the IgG levels in piglets from sows treated with oral metaloxacan were significantly higher on days one and two post farrowing uh, compared to the non treated or placebo. Uh, so I think that's uh, something that will be really interesting to, uh, to investigate further. Handing back to uh, Angela again now for the, for the uh, parts that she visited. Yes, hello. So um, I went to um, a workshop session looking at uh, precision pigs and um, it was all about kind of data collection and um, processing data, etc. Um, and uh, this particular um, presentation was on um, sort of the bits of kit that they were using. And um, the point that uh, Steve ne ne Beadle was making, who is a, an engineer, is um, that um, you know, if it's if it's not uh, if there isn't one available to uh, off the shelf, then uh, very often you can either make it or you can actually um, get it from um, another industry. So it might be sort of hiding in another area that you wouldn't normally consider. So some examples of this is. Um, <laughs> unusual looking contraption but it's a hotspot infrared scanner and um, it's a, like a demonstration project they have um, you may have seen that they they have quite a few pig fires um, over there through uh, to various regions and this particular scanner um, is one that um, can um, to scan to look at the baseline temperatures and uh, then can see if there is any hotspots arriving and then obviously cause alert and what was interesting is that you can actually um, program it to look at particular areas so you can see that in the, um, the top sort of uh, picture is the inside of the uh, of the barn and uh, the bottom one is kind of highlighting where um, engines are you've got sort of feed augers going there and augers and motors and it's particularly asking it to look at these areas because um, we would expect there to be problems from uh, a motor overheating or something like that so it can send out a, an early response and I thought that was quite a an interesting uh, piece of kit that they are developing. Um, another one is a wireless air, air quality sensor. Um, wireless and pig buildings don't normally go together. So um, I was quite interested in, in how they, well, what, what they've done and um, what they're collecting. So uh, they've managed to, uh, to, to make a, a prototype that uh, they can um, transmit data to. Um, wirelessly without having to hardwire it and uh, they were monitoring uh, methane because again um, they can have a methane build up from their uh, from the effluent um, and it, it just uh, shows the kind of uh, interesting data that they uh, they got back and uh, the sort of show levels for the methane um, where showing that there was in fact no ventilation even though the temperature was uh, pretty stable um, the methane was actually building up uh, dramatically to a point probably where you might expect there to be problems uh, with combustion. And the one on the right is showing that uh, when slurry is being agitated, again, that is releasing more methane uh, into the atmosphere. So maybe you need to be overventilating or something at that point. Um, but it was interesting that, that they were getting wireless sensors to 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 work, and um, they're hoping to record, um, monitor, you know, the the relative humidity and hydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide, and ammonia. But um, I know that we we do have carbon dioxide sensors here, but I, I I believe they are hardwired. So I was interested in the wireless aspect of that. Another one is the the electricity monitors and. Um, 
uh, I found this intriguing because I think we, we've already had a look at doing this or have done this with, I think Nigel Pennington was involved in a project about maybe 12 years or more ago, looking at um, where electric, electrical usage is occurring by attaching um, a, um, a um, monitor or a reader to each, in sorry, I'll just go, go back one. Oh, here we go. Uh, yeah, do, do you, the, can you just point to that? Yes, you're attaching these um, sort of individual uh, uh, gauges to uh, the, the separate electrical feeds to to each of the um, each of the motors, so that you can see what is being used. And then from that, you you get a a graph which um, uh, shows you where your peak periods are, and um, then you can maybe look at either improving efficiency or getting electrical. Um, any energy contract that might reflect um, your energy use but it's all knowledge and if you haven't got knowledge then um, you, you can't sort of act on it but I thought that was interesting because I say I think we, we did that um, you know over 12 years ago um, but what is good is that they are you know going out there and uh, collecting lots of data because without data you can't uh, you can't measure anything and you, then you can't make decisions and improve um, and I think it's good that they are, you know, it's interesting that they are investing in, in this real time data collection. And uh, you, I don't think, um, I think using technology is something that um, we have to be doing more often. Certainly we're doing work with these ultra high frequency tagging and, uh, and uh, readers and uh, programming information on these tags. And I think that is going to be really important to us in the future. Um, and then obviously for me, the, the last one I managed to go to was a, a presentation by Jennifer Patterson, um, Troubleshooting Reproductive Issues. And uh, this was a, an excellent paper for me because it just sort of highlighted what uh, what we're trying to achieve with our uh, Guilt Watch uh, initiative that uh, is ongoing at the moment. So um, looking at uh, to reproductive um, issues, uh, first of all, you do need a good recording system and, uh, and, and reproduction problems can be from a variety of, uh, of causes, uh, which are highlighted there. Um, and, you know, we know very well, you know, to look at these as a possible cause for the problems. But what we never actually really think about is the um, how the guilt has been reared from birth to first service. And this area is generally not captured on the farm uh, or even acted upon. And it is felt that this is, uh, this is a mistake. So um, the, uh, the reasons why this, uh, you know, could be. So here we have uh, stages of your guilt replacement as in from birth. So you can almost do your first pre-selected birth um, just from, you know, the confirmation number of teats, um, uh, health structure, uh, litter of origin and the, the litter of origin is um, incredibly important from um, the uh, at weaning from selection at weaning and then at, uh, at 140 days um, we shall show you in a minute why why that is um, and then when we finally uh, we finally select guilt to go into the guilt pool um, we um, she would advise that you actually select 125 percent of your requirements so it is allows you to then to select um, the uh, the best guilts going forward and the target for their um, for their selection is eight percent in estrus um, in the 28 days um, post uh, bore stimulation and then having no more than uh, than five to ten percent of what they call non-select so you're trying to select your prime animals uh, right from the word go um, and um, then when you come to serve then what you what you're actually serving is a hundred percent of your select gilts and uh, these are gilts have been managed to the, the right weight and they will have had at least one heat and um, you would be able to, because you know when they're coming on heat, then you'll be able to feed them appropriately before the breeding. So you really are stacking everything in favour of the guilt and uh, having that guilt having a good uh, productive life. Mm -hmm. But uh, we mentioned the, um, the litter of origin and um, Richard has also mentioned about birth weight in relation to, uh, to survivability and also uh, to growth because there was um, quite a disparity, I think uh, 14 days uh, difference in between um, good and um, 
a birth weight of less than um, a kilo. Um, but, uh, and again, low birth weight, we know the problems low birth weight can bring is on the production side, but it's also detrimental uh, on the reproductive side as well. Um, so ideally, um, we do not want to be selecting a low birth weight gilt, but um, there also is the, uh, the concept of uh, the litter phenotype. And so uh, this was gone on to explain uh, again the uh, the variation that we're getting. So we have individual birth weights. Uh, so this is showing us uh, six litters, uh, average birth weight 1.4. And you can see each of the individual dots as you look uh, vertically down each of the columns. Uh, we've got a, a line across at 1.4 and you can see the variation in birth weights. So um, again, we know that the gilts that um, have uh, less than a kilo will be uh, higher pre-winning mortality, um, will have poorer growth and uh, will have uh, impaired reproductive performance going forward. Um, but if you are producing animals from your, um, from your grandparents, the, it, it's worth noting the actual kind of quality of the litter in relation to uh, what they call the litter phenotype. So you can see that sow seven, eight and nine are having uh, predominantly smaller pigs, same litter size more or less, but predominantly smaller pigs. So they are producing um, the, um, they are contrib contributing to the units uh, number of, of small birth weight pigs and the, and the problems that gives you going forward into the uh, rearing and finishing, um, but is also uh, producing very small number of gilts that you are able to uh, select for or would want to select for your replacement gilts. So maybe this is our starting point when actually um, in choosing the, uh, the gilt in relation to her, to her birth weight, but also from the litter phenotype as well, as in um, what is the, um, the overall range and average of the, uh, of the birth weight. Um, yes, I think we've just um, we've talked about that, so we'll ping across. So when we talk about our select gilts, again, this is giving us a, an idea of uh, what we're hoping to achieve, uh, which we said that um, from bore exposure, we would want 80% uh, um, more um, that have cycled 30 days post exposure. And these are clusters, you know, the select, the prime ones. And then after that, um, you've got those animals which are responding that bit later. Uh, and those that also respond sort of very late or um, after uh, treatment with PG600. So ideally, uh, you need to be in a position where the majority of your animals are from uh, the select gilts, i.e. those that have responded to uh, puberty stimulation. Yeah, uh, but yes, I think we've talked about that. So, um, Records is everything. I think um, um, as an industry, there is uh, less evidence of people actually managing gilts, managing gilts and stimulating early puberty and also recording uh, pubertal heats and also making decisions to remove animals if they are uh, very slow responders. And, and I think this is something that we may have to look forward to look toward. Um, if we want to be bringing gilts into the herd that have a, a high potential to be retained until their parity five, six, seven, whenever uh, the herd is um, culling their animals. So uh, recording is uh, obviously key to uh, selecting the correct gilts and then also benchmarking your, um, then benchmarking your uh, performance as well. So um, you can see that we have very, the, the graph on the left, which looks like a firework, is all different groups and how they respond to, uh, to bore stimulation. So uh, to, uh, to finalise, um, it, it can be, uh, yes, many factors contributing to, uh, to the um, uh, reproductive problems. Um, this can often result in, in uh, Basically, uh, guilt development unit and management, uh, maybe not as much management going into this area, this critical area of puberty stimulation. Um, and uh, yes, to do, to do the puberty stimulation, we perhaps need to have um, a, a purpose built area with a good design and a good stimulation area and, um, and trained staff 
with time as well to do the heat detection and recording uh, procedures. Um, so uh, again, I thought that was a, an interesting uh, area and, um, and I say one that I think complements our uh, Guilt Watch um, uh, project uh, very nicely. So uh, I will now um, go back over to Richard, who will um, conclude. So uh, we've more or less come to the end of the um, presentation, uh, but I uh, we couldn't finish without uh, uh, thanking uh, Dr. Yolan Seddon, uh, Lee Whittington, Don and Nancy Lidster, Bob Fraser, and Jim Long from uh, Genesis Genetics, who were uh, very kind and, and helpful in, in both organising the trip and uh, actually while we was there. And uh, I think Angela and I uh, have to say that it's one of the friendliest places we've ever visited in our life. Uh, it's a fantastic country uh, across the board. And um, what I'd just like to sort of cover as a, as a conclusion, really, for, for what we've seen, what Angela and I uh, felt we uh, uh, got from the trip, really, was that in the end, uh, the Canadian industry is managing similar challenges uh, to us here in England, uh, particularly with the uh, uh, regards eating meat or not. Uh, but they are engaging with the public, as you saw early on, and um, trying to, uh, to work with all uh, sectors of, of society. Uh, they're aspiring uh, to similar welfare levels as us. They're definitely embracing technology. And um, as you saw by the previous picture, uh, the meat that they uh, produce, uh, Angela and I can confirm that the taste and succulence of the pork is, is absolutely excellent. And um, with that, I hope you're going to enjoy whatever meal you're having tonight. So um, thanks, Richard and Angela. That was a really interesting presentation, and I'm sure we only scratched the surface of some of those topics. Um, if anyone's got any questions or comments that they'd like to send through, um, do type those in the chat or question box um, right now. Um, in the meantime, to give you a chance to do that, um, we'll just remind all our listeners that the webinar is being recorded. So if there's anything that you missed or you wanted to go back and check, it will be available on the website in the next couple of days. Um, so, on to the questions. Um, we've just got a couple at the moment. Um, there may be some more coming through, but in the meantime, we'll just ask these two. Um, so, Richard, what price are Canadian pig farmers currently receiving? Well, well as you saw, uh, the, the cost of production they were telling us was $160 per pig produced, so that's the, the, the fat pig. And I, I did ask straight away, well, what, what does it cost to produce that pig? And they said their average actually would be somewhere between $160 and $170. But uh, they did say that a lot of the farmers obviously have a lower cost of production than the average, so some of it could be as low as $140. And so obviously they will be making more profit than the guys that have got a cost of production nearer uh, the price they're receiving for the pigs. And I think I mentioned earlier that um, if you do go down the organic route in, route in Canada with your pigs, uh, then you can uh, achieve a premium of up to $50 a pig more than the basic price. So that would be $210 uh, per pig. Comes at a cost, but obviously it's a niche market that uh, seems to be growing out there as well. Lovely, thanks Richard. Um, and another question, probably aimed at Angela, is what are the main genetics in Canada? Um, yes, um, well I think that it's um, PIC are uh, quite a prominent uh, genetics company. Um, and um, well, obviously, um, we met up with uh, Genesis, which um, is also, um, uh, well, it's their, home, it's their home country. So they also are, are there, but although maybe going towards more kind of a niche, more uh, production than than, uh, than PIC, they, they produce a, um, a, a quality pig for, um, I think, more for uh, with eating quality. I think is what they are uh, recognised for. So, but no, PIC, I think we're, we're the predominant genetics company. Okay, thanks. Um, we've got a couple more, um, and then we're probably going to have to wrap up. Um, so, the next question will be what would be the key take home message from the trip to the UK industry? Uh, 
for for my uh, key take home message although I haven't actually presented this in in this particular uh, webinar uh, one of the workshops that I went to was um, uh, talking about the um, retention and um, um, recruitment of, of staff and as I, I did mention briefly that it was a, a, an issue in Canada as it is elsewhere and probably in the world but certainly in, in, in England it is and this particular company was coming up with, with some uh, what I thought was some quite clever ideas they were saying basically that uh, if you're wanting to recruit people of a certain caliber then you have to really sell your company, whether it be a small company or a large company. Uh, I know in England that can be a little bit of a problem in respect of um, with all the media, uh, you're not wanting necessarily to be flagging up where you are in the country necessarily, but uh, they were saying, uh, you know, at the end of the day, if you wanted to recruit somebody under 35, for instance, then you really need to be on the on the web. Uh, or on um, that sort of social media and advertising your company and really sell it uh, so that you can actually attract the type of people that you want. So uh, something that we'll, we'll be following up on um, in, the, in the near future with other aspects of, of the trip that we did. And obviously we've, we've taken a snapshot tonight, but there is quite a lot more that we will be putting out there on, the, on our website and across our media and, and possibly in the pig world and elsewhere. Thanks, Richard. And we've just got one more question before we close up for the evening. Um, so the guilt room looks quite dark in the picture. Was it really, um, was it really around the 200 lux? Um, I think the, the picture probably didn't do it justice. Um, we, when we were walking around the unit, uh, it wouldn't have been 200 lux, but it was um, it was considerably lighter than some of the pig houses that uh, that we come across. I would say it was probably about one 100 lux at least. Um, they were all pretty well lit houses um, in the in the pig housing there. Um, just for my comments from the uh, from the trip, uh, some of the things that. I, I noticed or took home was um, that there is a, a willingness to fund research from um, you know from the industry or from other sort of um, industry bodies um, and um, a good structure I think to to deliver that and um, also that the, there are producers there who are embracing technology and uh, are able to get real-time recording, real-time data coming in, um, sp spend time admittedly sort of analysing that and uh, are now trying to improve using sort of the data coming in. So um, I think mine is um, sort of research there that's going on there and also uh, just the technology that, that um, is available for producers to, uh, to embrace if, if they want to. Thanks, Angela. Um, I think that's probably all we've got time for this evening. Um, as I said, we've covered quite a lot, so the recording will be available online in the next couple of days, so you can go back and check any of the details that you didn't manage to catch tonight. Um, so a big thank you to everyone that dialed in tonight. Um, we hope you enjoyed the presentation. And also a big thank you to Rich and Angela for taking time out of their busy schedules to join, join us and present tonight. Um, so um, with that, wishing everybody a good evening and um, Take care.